Hi everybody, it's Ms. Bresnahan. Now, today's video is going to be a combination of a lot of different topics. Um, I'm going to go over with you the green revolution, impacts of agricultural practices, irrigation methods, pest control methods, integrated pest management, meat production methods, and all folded in with this, I'm gonna talk about alternatives and sustainable agriculture um, as a way to, to consider solutions to the problems that come from industrial, large scale, a lot of modern agriculture techniques that we um, have been employing as of late. So let's go ahead and get started here. So first of all, the green revolution is not referring to a revolution that is green, like environmentally friendly. So take that, that type of green out of your mind for this, okay? We're talking about a shift to new agricultural strategies and practices in order to increase food production over the last 100 years. And we're talking about strategies that include mechanization, genetically modified organisms, chemical fertilizers, irrigation, and the use of other chemicals like pesticides. Now, the thing about the Green Revolution is it can increase profits and efficiency, but also um, during this time, we have really increased our reliance on fossil fuels to the point where the agricultural industry is very addicted to fossil fuels. So with industrial agriculture comes this very big industry, and um, this is agribusiness or, or ag business, um, or we call them big, big ag companies. So here are some familiar names that you might know, uh, Deer and Company, Bayer Ag, Archer Daniels Midland, Dow DuPont, which is a merger. Cargill, Scott's miracle Grow, and Tyson you might be familiar with um, as well. So um, Deer and Company, um, so these aren't really necessarily in any order here. You might know that as John Deere Company, you know, um, came from a, a man who started repairing farm equipment to this really big industrial um, giant. Um, and they have in 2018, so I'll give you some figures here just so you can understand how big this is. By no means you needed to know these figures. I just want to kind of paint a picture for you. So in 2018, the revenue of Deer and Company was $38.4 billion. So Bayer Ag is actually a company that's in Germany. Now Bayer produces pharmaceuticals, but they also invest in uh, crop science. Um, in 2018, they purchased another giant company, Monsanto. And Monsanto, that's the company that's responsible for creating the, um, the, the herbicide Roundup. Um, and Roundup contains a glyphosate that you should know. Well, anyway, they purchased um, Monsanto in 2018 for $60 billion. That's how big Bayer is. Archer Daniels Midland is a company that focuses on, um, uh, they have, first of all, they have 270 different plants and 420 different uh, crop procurement facilities. And there they process grains, oil seeds, and these things then go into the food and beverage industry um, and eventually to consumers, uh, the nutraceutical industry, industrial, they use things for industrial purposes, and also they make animal feed products, Archer Daniels. Dow DuPont, their revenue in 2018 was $85.97 billion, um, and they employ 98,000 people. This is the world's largest chemical company in terms of total sales. In 2017, um, there was a merger between Dow Chemicals and DuPont Chemicals. Um, DuPont is absolutely huge. Um, now we have this merger between Dow and DuPont. Um, now they have an agricultural division, a materials science division, and a specialty products division. We will touch base more on DuPont when we get into our um, 
unit on chemicals and pollution. Um, yeah. Cargill, uh, so Cargill, their revenue in 2018 was $114.7 billion. They employ 166,000 people. Um, this is one of the largest family owned companies in the United States. Um, and they are responsible for about 25% of American meat and grain exports. They operate in 40 countries. Um, and they have a lot of business with, uh, livestock and aquaculture or farming fish farmers and also feed manufacturers. That's Cargill. And I just put Scott's miracle Grow on the list so that you understand that that's a major, um, you know, agribusness in Tyson where, uh, they process poultry products is a huge one as well. So let's talk about energy subsidy here. Um, and I want to point out something really important. Um, so energy subsidy is the fossil fuel energy and human energy input per calorie of food produced. So in environmental science and agricultural science, we want to know, are we getting out of, of something, the amount of energy that we're putting in? And if not, what is the deficit? Okay. So how much energy is going in in terms of fossil fuels? How much energy is going in in terms of human energy? And how many calories? In other words, how much energy can we actually consume from the output? So this considers our diet, right? So in the United States, a, there is an average of a 10 calorie energy input for every one calorie that you consume. And by the way, I'm talking about um, like food calories. For instance, if it'll say like on the back of a lot of food labels uh, for a 2000 calorie diet. So they're actually referring to kilocalories. We'll get more into details about that later, but um, for every one calorie, okay? So one of those um, that you consume, it, take, it requires 10 calories of energy to put into it. So my point is that kind of diet is very inefficient. That kind of diet that on average an American is requiring a lot of energy inputs from the production of the food, the um, growing the food to feed the food, <laughs> um, the water that's used, the transportation of it from point A to point B to point C to point D. And all of that requires a lot of energy just to get a little measly calorie. Um, now, we also have fossil fuel use, not just due to transportation, but fossil fuels go into the production of chemicals, um, fertilizers and pesticides, but then also spreading them onto, onto fields. Um, fossil fuels go into irrigation to power that, okay? Basically, anything that requires energy is going to require I mean, it depends on where it's grown, um, but it's going to be, it's going to require energy that's mainly fossil fuels. Um, we haven't broken away from that, and the agriculture industry sure certainly has not. Let's have a look at the right-hand side here where there are um, some energy subsidies listed here. A lot of the math has been done for you where you're comparing just calories to calories. So these are different diets here. Um, or no. Yeah. Oh, producing certain types of food. Yeah. Okay. Producing certain types of food. So looking at that 10 typical U S diet require it's a, um, the energy subsidy is 10. Um, typical U S diet in 1950 was five. Okay. A little bit more efficient there. Large, um, producing large scale eggs versus small scale eggs could fall anywhere between one and maybe three. Uh, Coastal fishing, so if you relied only on fish for your diet, then your energy subsidy would be somewhat low. And that's that's if it was coastal fishing. If it was far offshore fishing and required large-scale transportation, and that is very inefficient, um, going to that 20 level there. Um, Small-scale corn, 0.2 um, calories of input for every one calorie consumed. So that would be very efficient. And 
let's look at this graph as well. So let me get this menu to disappear here. So we're looking at kilowatt hours per pound. So now we're looking at a different unit. Instead of calories for, to get calories, now we're looking at how many kilowatt hours of energy are required to produce one pound of food, okay? Have a look at beef. How many kilowatt hours are required to produce one pound of beef? You should have said right around 32. So 32 kilowatt hours to produce one pound of beef. How about pork? Looks like it's right in between 10 and 15, maybe about 12 and a half kilowatt hours per pound of pork. Cheese a little bit less than that. Chicken a little bit less than five kilowatt hours per pound. And then we have eggs less than that. Well, maybe not that much less. Apples, milk, and corn. You can see that the meat products are requiring a lot more energy per pound um, than things like apples. Okay, so we're going to get into the efficiency of diets and the sustainability of diets um, within this section as well. So the next thing that I want to talk about are impacts of agriculture. So this first one that I'm showing you is, this is a method that's not used in the United States slash and burn agriculture, but is used in Brazil still to clear out rainforest land. And so I want you to understand some impacts of that. And then we'll talk about large scale um, industrial ag as well and the impacts of that, okay? So here's what I want you to focus on while you're taking notes. I want you to focus on what it is, whether that's a verbal description that I give you. I want you to focus on impacts, which I will list for you. I also want you to focus on what are some solutions, some alternatives, some ways of combating and solving the problems and reducing the impacts, okay? So slash and burn agriculture is when wild or forested land is clear cut and any remaining vegetation is burned. And obviously the whole reason be behind this is to clear out the land. Well, what happens when you burn it is it delivers some nutrients to the soil via the ash and the material that you have, or the leftovers from what you have burned. Well, the fact of the matter is, remember, this is done in tropical regions a lot. And the thing about um, tropical regions is the soil is very nutrient poor. You might think, oh, there's all this depth of the soil. It's been accumulating all this matter. There's been biomass there using the nutrients on overdrive. There are no nutrients um, in tropical soils where there have been, been rainforests. Um, I know that seems weird, but that is the case. So, um, so anyway, so slash and burn, so it delivers some nutrients to the soil, but the fact is, is that nutrients from the ash are very temporary. They are used up very, very quickly. And what ends up happening is farmers must abandon the land um, once the land is degraded, and then they have to move to a new plot of land. They have to clear more forest in order to do that. So deforestation is a direct consequence, you know, of t cutting down trees for cropland. Um, there's a loss of habitat and species. There's an increase in air pollution and the release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. That contributes to global climate change. And also an increase in accidental fires occurs as well um, with slash and burn agriculture. So what are some solutions to this? So some solutions would be to protect land, set it aside and say, this is not for agriculture, but also you can go ahead and protect land, but you have to enforce it. So there has to be funding behind the, the regulations, okay? Now, the other option would be to educate farmers so that they are using the land more wisely. So if you cut down all of this land and then you uh, plant something that requires a lot of nutrients, it's just going to take all those nutrients and then the land is going to be degraded and then the cycle repeats. One of the options is to intercrop. 
Okay, so this is sustainable agriculture. I'm kind of throwing little tidbits at you here and there. So intercropping means, I mean, you can do it a few different ways. You can have like a row of one crop, a row of another, a row of one crop, a row of another, or you can sort of plant them, you know, in between each other. Well, there's one type of plant called Inga, and it is one of those plants like legumes that hosts nitrogen fixing bacteria. Well, that's really great because remember, nitrogen is very inaccessible in the atmosphere. And in order to get it into the soil so that it can be then taken up by plants, there has to be some bacteria action fixing that nitrogen, okay? Putting it into the soil, fixing it, making it usable. And so some benefits of Inga are adding the nitrogen to the soil, okay? It hosts those nitrogen fixing bacteria. So you could intercrop with it. So have your Inga and then have the plant that you maybe are trying to grow to sell for a profit, like soy or something like that. Um, and so educating farmers would have to be done and then using this intercrop method. The other thing about Inga is um, some benefits is it provides shade. Um, to plants, and so it can also be a supportive habitat. Um, it can eliminate evaporation um, and and prevent a water loss in soils. Uh, you can eat it. Um, it shades out weeds, so it actually acts as a natural way to to prevent weeds from growing. And you you have to use less chemicals if um, like herbicides. Obviously, it returns nutrients to the soil, um, and it lowers the temperature with that shade and protects the soil um, as well. Also acts as root systems and are locking in that soil, preventing erosion, and it, it supports other crops. So there's a solution to slash and burn. All right, let's move on to large-scale industrial farming techniques. So tilling is one practice um, that is very common with large-scale machinery, um, you know, and then there's small-scale tilling as well, you know, just with, um, with some handheld farm equipment. So the thing about tilling is, um, it is it's a practice that releases carbon into the atmosphere. Soil, you have to remember, is a huge storehouse for carbon. So we think about forests as like forests sequester carbon, but actually an ecosystem service of, of, um, of soils is that soils sequester carbon as well. Um, and that's really important because the release of carbon in the atmosphere contributes to climate change. And so we want to keep carbon in the living things and out of the atmosphere as much as possible. Um, so tilling also loosens up all of that soil um, and it causes soil erosion, allows that loose soil to be washed away. And remember, a lot of the nutrients are in that top layer um, of, of the soil column. And so you really wanna protect the O horizon and the A horizon or that top soil horizon and make sure that it stays there to provide nutrients for the plants that are living above and relying on, on that. So when soil erosion occurs um, and you have all of this loose soil washed away, it actually increases or accelerates surface runoff. And then also soil erosion or the movement of particles in, through a watershed, it releases nutrient pollution like nitrogen and phosphorus. And the problem with nutrient pollution is it leads to eutrophication. So let's go ahead and have a look at this diagram here on the bottom. This shows how you can have agricultural runoff. You could have sewage that contains these nutrients as well. Um, and then also detergents. Um, so things basically running off of the land and putting this stuff like nutrients into water bodies. So then what happens is you have increased plant growth. And with that increased plant growth, then that's going to cause more algae growth, okay, as well. And as the algae dies and decomposes, it uses up a lot of oxygen. And that could possibly create dead zones. And so when you have a lot of decomposing uh, plants, it creates what we call a hypoxic 
environment or possibly an anoxic, totally without oxygen type of environment. And that can cause dead fish. Um, we see that in, um, in the Great Lakes with agricultural runoff. We see that in the Chesapeake Bay with agricultural runoff. And we certainly see that in the Gulf of Mexico with nutrient pollution from agriculture as well with the, with the Mississippi River um, uh, releasing large amounts of water into the Gulf. So what's the solution here? The solution is no-till agriculture, and that is very possible. So um, there's a large movement trying to train farmers and actually a lot of science behind what happens when you train farmers. Well, when farmers are trained um, to use no-till agriculture and given an alternative method um, that is efficient and they can actually do it and they understand it and then it actually and it saves them money in the long run They're able to have to produce more food in the long run They're able to spend less money on pesticides and herbicides and and just protecting the soil Actually, they see it as, as being a benefit, but training farmers is really important the other thing that we can do, and you know, we can say like no till agriculture. But the thing is, if you want to go ahead and use that as a as an answer or a solution, how is that going to happen? Train farmers is one. The other thing is to incentivize no till practices. There's different ways to incentivize people to 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 practice a certain behavior or take a certain action. And one way would be to um, tax farms that till. Now, uh, punishment isn't necessarily something that is that we're really interested in. Uh, a better way would be to incentivize with a positive reinforcement. So subsidize farms. In other words, provide some, um, some funding to farms that practice no-till agriculture. Or provide some funding to farmers who participate in training programs um, for no-till agriculture. And then that way that would um, incentivize them to carry out that practice and then, um, and then continue to do it. So another practice is chemical pest control. And you read about this in the textbook. Um, you read about herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, rodenticides. These are all chemical treatments for controlling pests. So what are the impacts of this? One is pesticide resistance. Uh, so when, <clears throat> when certain pests are targeted with a chemical treatment, some of them are going to survive, right? So this is the, kind of like a method of artificial um, selection. So some of them survive, they pass on the genes to the next round, all of a sudden you have a population of survivors where your chemical treatment doesn't work against them anymore. Um, so, <clears throat> so that's called the pesticide treadmill when you have to keep developing stronger and stronger pesticides, pesticide resistance, stronger and stronger pesticides, okay? Uh, the other impact is that these chemicals kill non-target species. And we're talking about species that could be actually be beneficial in a agricultural environment. So like bees, pollinators, okay? Um, these actually work uh, do provide a service to a crop, but um, but a lot of pesticides kill those non-target species. Also, a lot of these target um, non-target species that aren't necessarily beneficial directly to that agricultural land, but instead um, are you know are are keystone species in an environment or maybe species that are risking extinction. So one example is a bald eagle or a peregrine falcon. Birds that are high up on the food chain are really vulnerable to bioaccumulation and biomagnification. So let's get that straight here. So bioaccumulation is when there's a contaminant in an environment and then over time, as an individual ages and they continue to consume the same exact food that itself is polluted, then what happens is that contaminant builds up and builds up and builds up in their system because our, our systems lack the ability to process and to, to metabolize 
those foreign types of chemicals. So the contaminant builds up and the toxicity increases when the contaminant builds up in their system and then they end up dying from poison. Um, and then biomagnification, this is what occurs um, between different types of organisms. So you can have something really low on the food chain, insects, larvae, um, whatever it may be, and then the next level up consumes that and then they get that contaminant passed on. And then the next level up consumes that and that contaminant passes on. The next level up consumes that and they get that contaminant passed on. And with each successive level, more and more of that contaminant is concentrated within those organisms. So by the time you get to the species or the organisms that are high up on the food chain, those ones contain really high levels of some pollutants. And this is what Rachel Carson wrote about in her book, Silent Spring, with the chemical DDT, which is a pesticide that was commonly used and is now banned in the United States, um, thankfully, and not in all, all the other countries. But um, but anyway, we noticed that that's really what was uh, what was causing problems. And I think I told you guys this earlier this year where DDT was building up in um, birds of prey, like peregrine falcons, bald eagles. And, and what was happening is it was causing the their eggs to be really thin and fragile. And when they would go um, to, to, to nest, then they would just crack the eggs. Um, so then the survival of the, the species was becoming really, really low to the point where we had to, um, to put them in some, um, some programs to, to get the species to uh, repopulate. So it's been largely successful, but we'll talk about that more later. Um, so anyway, killing non-target species, these are all things that do jobs for, for ecosystems. And, and after all, if we're regarding um, farmland and cropland as something that's not an ecosystem, then we're gonna see some really big problems here. Um, another impact of chemical pest control is groundwater pollution. In other words, chemicals getting into drinking water, contaminating it, and then we also have human health impacts from this as well. And we'll get more into pollution later and kind of what, some, what are some things that we do about um, about that. So what are some solutions? So integrated pest management is a solution and really trying to use other things besides um, besides chemicals to um, to solve our problems that that are are from pests. And there's a lot involved. Yes, pests can be a huge problem. Um, so yes, some chemicals need to be used if we want to protect our food supply. Um, but we have to train people to use integrated pest management and really try to limit those chemicals as much as possible and provide some alternative methods. Other methods are to not plant a monoculture. Um, a monoculture in, is very susceptible to, in, to, to insects. Um, a monoculture is very susceptible to a big crash. And so we can use per permaculture or polyculture and planting many different types of plants within one area. And then the insects that rely on those plants can actually be beneficial predators to the insects that are feeding on the other ones. And you can have an ecosystem there. And then finally, crop rotation can be really helpful um, where you're not always planting the same exact thing where it's susceptible to certain types of pests. So if you rotate the crops, then you're not always going to have the same types of pests around and you're going to create an environment where the population isn't going to get out of control. So synthetic fertilizers, also chemicals, um, have some problems involved um, with those. And the fact is, is that fertilizers contain nutrients, right? That's the whole point of them. So they can contain nutrients like nitrogen. And what happens with fertilizers is you can have nitrate leaching, which is the leaching of your nutrient into, into the ground, into the groundwater, eventually into streams and rivers, into larger water bodies. And that reduces the water quality. And I already talked to you a little bit about eutrophication and how eutrophication can lead to harmful algal blooms and um, those can cause dead zones. So you're looking at a, an algal bloom here in this body of water. And I do wanna point out that 
al harmful so algal blooms can cause problems in a couple of different ways when the algae dies then it then it uses a lot of oxygen and creates an anoxic or hypoxic environment but also um, sometimes the algae that grows could be dangerous and could you know and could be could pose a threat to wildlife that's around there um, if there's some sort of um, chemical in the algae that is harmful or a bacteria that's harmful to um, to organisms in the area. Um, also with with nitrate leaching, so nit then this stuff gets into drinking water supplies. And when nitrate gets into drinking water, um, so first of all, it's monitored in the United States. Um, we're required to monitor how much nitrate is in there. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what the regulation is and why are we allowed to have more nitrate in our water here than people in Europe. Um, well, anyway, nitrate could cause a big problem. And one of the health impacts of nitrate in drinking water is blue baby syndrome, um, where the nitrate um, in the blood reduces oxygen carrying capacity and literally a baby's skin and, and face turns blue. Um, also impaired livestock is associated, um, impaired livestock production is associated with nitrate in drinking water. The other thing about synthetic fertilizers is it requires energy to produce them. Um, it's actually a very fossil fuel intensive process um, to go through and, and actually create nitrates um, and, cre and create ammonia um, through a chemical process. So we're talking about large industrial pro um, complexes producing fertilizer to then um, you know, be deposited onto land. So the production requires energy and um, using synthetic in fertilizers indirect, indirectly uses fossil fuels and contributes to climate change. So what are some solutions here? Using cover crops to basically um, lock in the soil, keep it there, host nitrogen fixing, um, bacteria on their root nodules and to provide some um, and to basically keep the soil there, keep the nutrients there. Uh, you need to do everything that you can to reduce runoff from agricultural fields. So that includes field buffers and that's an okay solution. So there's lots of streams um, by, uh, by farms and by you know, cattle ranches and things like that. So a buffer would be great so that you're limiting the amount of runoff that actually goes into streams. Buffers outlining streams are great. And also preventing cat. So this is actually kind of related to organic um, like manure. So you want to keep your, keep cows and keep pigs away from streams. Um, don't let them near there, have a different supply for water, because then they're just going to flock to those areas and there's, it's just going to be overladen with, with waste products. Also precision application, so not applying too much and actually using some technology, some smart technology to apply very precisely what is needed instead of too much. And if you're applying too much, then it's not being taken up by the plant and it's going into the water bodies instead. So there is a safe way to do it. Um, I also want to point out that surface applied organic manure is not a good solution. So you may think like, oh, synthetic fertilizers are bad. Let's put organic fertilizer. Let's put manure all over it. That's, that's, that is an alternative choice, but that's not necessarily the better solution because it also contains um, high amounts of nitrogen. So it's still, if you have manure, it needs to be, you know, applied in a precise manner. The same, it could have the same exact problems. So monocropping is another agricultural practice where you have large plantings of a single species or variety. And this can cause soil erosion, risk of large scale crop failure due to high vulnerability of pests. Um, and that's because there's low genetic diversity and a lack of, of predators. So an example of the devastation monocultural farming can cause is the corn blight of 1970, which ruined more than 15% of corn crops in North America. 
and this happened due to 70% of the crop being grown at the same high yield variety, making the corn more susceptible to harmful organisms. Um, a contrasting method to monoculture is instead polyculture or permaculture. And permaculture is like, it's a reversal in that it promotes biodiversity and implantation of a diverse range of crops instead of just one crop. And this method of farming intends to ensure the ecosystem remains strong with different plants working together and to thrive on that land. And it aims to avoid having anything from becoming too influential on the farm. Um, so monoculture, very vulnerable. And also monocultures require a lot of synthetic fertilizers because they're so vulnerable to pests um, and because they you know, are using the same exact nutrients over and over and over again. There's lots of fertilizers that are used, pesticides, herbicides, and um, all these things contribute to water pollution. All of, and then using pesticides then causes uh, pesticide resistance. So monocultures are associated with that pesticide treadmill thing. Genetic engineering is also a common practice, but I do want to point out that the science of trying to figure out, you know, what are the exact harmful effects of it is limited at this time. Um, there's lots of groups of people that say don't eat GMOs, GMOs are really bad. The reality is, is that some might be harmful in an indirect way, um, but there's no science behind, you know, them being like toxic or anything like that. So there's lots of groups of people that kind of claim that. And I just want you to distinguish the difference between science and like trends. So genetic engineering is when there's the isolation of a specific gene from one organism and then it's transferred into the genetic material of another. Um, in terms of, okay, well, actually, here's, here's the example given in your textbook. So here's a good thing. So, um, there is a certain type of bacteria that, um, when consumed by a certain type of insect, then, um, or the European corn borer, then that insect is then poisoned. Okay. So the thought is with GMOs is like, well, let's insert that gene from the bacteria into the corn. So if the corn borer, borer tries to consume the corn, then it itself is poison. So basically the corn contains a pesticide in its genetic material. Um, so that's an example of a GMO. A GMO is not like crossbreeding like dogs. <laughs> that's not a GMO. Okay, we're talking about food here. So impacts, environmental impacts. GMOs may breed with wild relatives. And then what happens is we have a loss of genetic diversity in the agricultural world. Um, and we might need to have that genetic diversity later. And it's also an unnatural species. So in the future, you know, are we gonna have a lot of these, you know, ecosystems that aren't able to withstand um, natural, um, natural changes because they don't contain those many eons of years of evolution to to allow them to combat changes in some way and those are those are kind of hypothetical things here um gmos encourage the use of chemicals um in a lot of cases you know the bt gene is an example where we're trying to eliminate a chemical um but and instead add it to the corn um but they encourage the use of chemicals because, well, here's an example. Um, round, so Monsanto used to sell, or they, they still sell, Roundup Ready seeds to farmers. And these are seeds where you can go ahead and spray your whole entire field with Roundup, which is a weed killer, and then plant your Roundup Ready seeds. So everything else will be killed except the Roundup Ready seeds, your crop plant. And they actually lock you into this contract where, you know, if you buy Roundup and you buy your Roundup Ready seeds from them, then you can continue to, um, to, use those, to use those chemicals. But what you can't do is you cannot grow your plant and then take a seed from that plant and then plant it. That's illegal. Um, 
So you have to continue to buy the seeds from them. And that's a huge economic cost. Um, and there's some, some issues involved with that. In terms of human health concerns, um, some concerns that GMOs don't contain a large variety of nutrients that a lot of other wild native relatives, um, or I guess I should say, yeah, native organisms do contain. Um, so that's really the concern, not that it's toxic, but that it's just not as good for us. So some solutions are food labeling, and some people say that, you know, that's not right because we're telling people, hey, here's here's a non-GMO food, don't buy that GMO food, um, it's bad for you. So that's a little controversial. Um, and another solution is just to do more research and find out more about the ecological and public health impacts. But right now it's very difficult to go anywhere and eat anything that's not a GMO. Um, a lot of foods that we eat are. Irrigation is the um, is just putting water onto your land, and some impacts of irrigation are overuse and depletion of freshwater resources. Water logging is a problem. If too much water is used, it's sitting on the surface, and it raises the water table and ends up inhibiting um, plants and their ability to absorb oxygen through their roots. Okay, so starves them of, of oxygen, water logging. In salinization in soil, so there's a little bit of salt type compounds in, in all water. And in irrigation water, what ends up happening is if, if over time you have some high amounts of evaporation of that water that's situated near the surface or on the surface, then those salts all become concentrated in the soil. And eventually it leads to soil degradation um, with salinization. So what are some solutions here to improve efficiency? Um, utilize drip irrigation, which I'll talk about. Use smart technology. Um, use drought tolerant crops in place in arid environments. And then also use cover crops to shade um, areas and eliminate a lot of the evaporation that causes problems. Irrigation, by the way, is the largest human use of fresh water, um, and fresh water is a non-renewable resource, um, and we are not desalinating ocean water for our drinking water supplies. We really have to be careful about the use of it. So types of irrigation methods include flood, furrow, spray, and drip irrigation. Flood and fur furrow irrigation, um, here's flood on the top right. This is just flooding a field. Um, and then just doing it all at once and then just allowing that water to slowly percolate into the ground. Um, the thing about it is it's very, very, very inefficient. You're wasting a lot of water um, to do that, um, to pump it up there and then leave it on the field just to, just to evaporate. It's cheap though and it's low tech. That's why people do it. Furrow irrigation refers to um, having sort of these raised areas where your plants are growing and then these little um, furrows uh, where that water can then situate in. So you're kind of flooding, but you have your, your plants that are situated, or situated at a higher elevation. And then all the water then runs into this channel, this larger channel, and there's a lot of water that's lost here. So it also is very inefficient. Anytime you're using water and it's not all going to the its you know intended purpose, then you're wasting it. Spray irrigation is a little bit more efficient and loses about 25% of water applied. Um, it's still not great though um, because you are putting a lot of water into the air. It's not all going onto your field. Um, you put, could be putting more on than what is needed. Um, but this is when groundwater is pumped into spray nozzles and it goes across the field. Um, and this is when you see those like um, crop circles. I think that I was showing you. Yeah. These, that's from spray irrigation. Um, and then, so then these large arms would just kind of like spin around. There's different ways of doing it, but that's one of them. Now the equipment is expensive. So this is, so this is gonna depend on how much money you have, all right? So like, if you don't have a lot of money, then you're gonna use flood and furrow. It's not gonna be efficient, okay? So very wasteful. Um, and then spray irrigation, if you have a little bit more money, you can afford to buy this type of technology. 
Um, you can improve it by, um, by hanging pipes instead of spraying the water at really high pressures. Um, so here we can see that these pipes are sort of hanging down and then that water is um, being released at a different pressure and you're reducing the amount that can go into the atmosphere when you have those. Now, drip irrigation is the preferred method, but it can be really expensive because you have all these teeny tiny little hoses that have perforations or little holes in them to release really small amounts of water over time to the, directly to the plant roots. So you're limiting and sometimes that they're buried a little bit beneath the surface to deliver that water to the plants. Um, and only 5% of water is lost with this. It's expensive, um, especially if you have really, really large areas that can be really expensive. Um, a lot of small organic farms might use a method like this um, because they can afford to, you know, to, to irrigate on a small plot of land with it. And then the Ogallala, so just in terms of, of water, you guys are going to watch a video. So the Ogallala Aquifer is this really large um, underground reservoir um, that sit, is situated underneath um, Kansas and Oklahoma and northern Texas. Um, and anyway, this, so this supplies a lot of water to these areas that are very agriculture intensive. It's responsible for 30% of all irrigation in the United States. Well, the thing is, is that the aquifer recharges far slower than the water is withdrawn. And this is water that has been building up over millions and millions of years and we're withdrawing it at an unprecedented rate. This is a water level change in feet, um, declines in red and rises in blue. And we can see 150 um, feet of decline in some of these areas here. And a lot of these areas are like almost desert-like conditions. And we're using the Ogallala Aquifer to, uh, to irrigate a desert. And the last thing I want to talk about is meat production. Um, and... And the very first lesson number one is producing meat is very inefficient. It takes 20 times more land to produce the same amount of calories from meat as from plants. Um, there's a few different meat production. Well, there's two main meat production methods. Concentrated animal feeding operations, also known as CAFOs, or we call them feedlots. The drawback of them is that they're crowded. Animals are fed grains or feed that aren't as suitable as grass. They're just fed food just to kind of... Um, beef them up um, so that they can gain weight really, really, really quickly. They can't really move around. It's not like, you know, an ideal environment for, for animals. So a lot of human, or not human, a lot of animal rights activists are very against cathos because it's uh, very inhumane. It generates a large amount of organic waste as well. Um, you can just look at this picture here. Imagine how much waste, how much hog waste is produced um, in this small space here. And what do you do with it? So that contaminates ground and surface water if it's not disposed of properly. Um, you know, it'd be, it'd be nice if they could, you know, take that, take that material and then make it into a compost and use that as fertilizer in some way. Sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. Benefits are that it's cheap. And because it's cheap, it keeps consumer costs really low. And this is, we can have a dollar hamburger at McDonald's. Free range grazing is another option. Um, and this seems like, oh, these animals are really happy, you know, like, but, um, but there are some environmental drawbacks here. It requires a lot of land. Um, the meat produced is more expensive because you're using more land. You're also not feeding them cheap food. Um, you're feeding them the, the grass and the products that are growing on that land. Um, so you have to every once in a while kind of rotate things around and let them graze here and then let them graze here the next year, let them graze here the next year. So um, there's certainly some planning involved there. Some threats are overgrazing. This is when too many animals feed on a particular area of land and it causes a loss of vegetation and soil erosion. And overgrazing can lead to desertification. This is when soil gets really compacted. This is like 
this is the degradation of soil in areas that aren't really desert, that are like that semi-arid, like savanna landscapes or um, dry like grasslands that are on the fringe. This is where they're really at a threat of becoming deserts. And if the soil becomes degraded, they could be desertified. Um, so anyway, desertification is an issue. And then benefits of free range grazing is that it allows um, grass grazing to occur during the entire life cycle of the animal. So um, animal rights activists like this a little bit more because it's more humane. And then also because the animals are not kept in these really tight conditions, then it requires less antibiotics and less chemicals and the organic waste then gets deposited directly on the land and there's less of it in one concentrated area that you have to like put into a, a manure lagoon or something like that. So you have this large area of land where they all just poop all over. So what are some solutions? There's one solution. The solution is to reduce meat consumption. In the United States, we consume a lot of meats and that's not true for every other country. Um, so reduce meat consumption um, and some bullets here to recognize eating lower on the trophic chain is more efficient. Remember how I learned about the 10% rule and how when when you go up one level on the trophic chain, then only 10% of the energy is transferred. So if we skip the middleman, and so what we're doing when we eat meat, for instance, we'll eat beef or a hamburger or whatever, then what we're doing is we are consuming the cow, and then we're also consuming some of the calories that the cow ate, what did it eat? Grass, or maybe it was grown in or raised in a feedlot, so grain. So we could just consume the producer product directly and skip that middleman, the cow. So that's what I mean, it's very inefficient. Um, it reduces, um, oh, reducing meat consumption also reduces carbon dioxide emissions, methane emissions, methane emissions that come directly from cattle waste, um, and nitrous oxide emissions um, that come from when you have too much nitrogen sitting on the on land surface. It also conserves water, reduces the use of antibiotics and growth hormones, and improves topsoil. So this chart is showing um, kilogram of consumed, sorry, so carbon dioxide emissions for every kilogram of consumed food. And we can see with lamb, the, um, and it's in, we have two parts of our bar here, post farm gate emissions, including processing, transport, retail, cooking, waste disposal. And then also there's production emissions, including emissions before the product leaves the farm. So lamb, um, total of 39.2 kilograms of carbon dioxide emissions for every kilogram of lamb consumed. Beef is next up on the list at 27 kilograms of carbon dioxide emissions. Um, cheese is down there. And then if we just find some replacements, so like potatoes, rice, peanut butter, nuts, yogurt, broccoli, tofu, all of these things are, are lower on the list here, um, actually contributing to less carbon dioxide emissions. So did you know that your diet could contribute to climate change? Okay, so veganism and the environment by the numbers, just to kind of go through this infographic a little bit. So three primary gases are responsible for global warming. Carbon dioxide is one of them. Um, if one person exchanges a regular car for a hybrid, they'll reduce carbon dioxide emissions by one ton per year. Um, methane is another one. Uh, chickens, turkeys, pigs, um, cows collectively produce, um, are the largest producer of methane in the United States. Um, and methane is 20 times more powerful at trapping heat than carbon dioxide. Nitrous oxide, meat, egg, and dairy industries produce 65% of worldwide 
um, carb or nitrous oxide emissions. Um, 300 times more powerful than carbon dioxide trapping heat. So let's talk a little bit about sustainable agriculture, which you are actually going to watch a video and learn a lot more about this. So these are just some methods of being more sustainable. So intercropping, I mentioned earlier, is a method in which two or more crop species are planted in the same field at the same time to promote synergistic interaction. And so what I mean by that is if you look at this top right picture, you know, these types of plants here, might, they might be the crop plant and then the other plants around it host some species that then actually could maybe feed on the, what would otherwise be pests to these other plants. So you have this synergistic interaction. Maybe you have nitrogen fixing plants or, or plants that host nitrogen fixing bacteria to replace, um, to replace nutrients in the soil. Um, and I just want to point out something. So when we're growing food and we have a huge human population, um, we've sort of seen it in the past this is why the green revolution has happened is because we've found out a way where we can just like produce just a ton of food, a ton of food, a ton of food, and it's mainly corn and grains. And um, we can do this and, and we don't really have to be efficient because we can still make money off of it. But we're finding a lot of, you know, environmental degradation uh, occurs as a result. But the reality is, is that sustainable agriculture involves creating an environment that is more like an ecosystem. So when you're trying to come up with solutions for problems that are involved with agriculture, you have to think about how can you make it more like a natural ecosystem? So permaculture or polyculture are similar things. This is when there's carefully selected plants intercropped to mimic a natural ecosystem. And agroforestry is an agricultural technique that also involves intercropping. And trees and vegetables are intercropped. And agroforestry is a really smart technique to use in places where um, it's maybe a dry environment and you want to um, you want to prevent water loss through evaporation and conserve the water that you're using, especially in those dry, arid environments. You know, the water that you're getting is few and far between to begin with. So, um, crop rotation is another practice um, which crop species in a field are rotated from season to season. And so, one thing that you could do is you could plant something that requires a lot of nutrients one year. And then the next year, plant something that actually replenishes those nutrients or helps to assist in replenishing those nutrients um, the next year. So rotating crops is smart. Um, contour plowing is what you can see on the right-hand side here. And this is a method to reduce runoff. Okay, so this is a solution to decrease soil erosion and slow the flow of water if you plow in in a way where it kind of goes along with the topography of the land. So you can see that there's easily, there's a channel here. Um, and instead of having a gap where water can flow directly through there, you're basically creating all these little water buffers um, that run um, perpendicular to stream flow. No-till agriculture, I mentioned to you, this is when farmers do not turn the soil between seasons as a means of reducing topsoil erosion. And that kind of wraps things up for today's lesson, um, and we will we will continue with this later. Thanks.